back to Yahoo Finance 2020, A Time for Change. Now, it's been more than 150 years since the end of the Civil War and the start of an era called Reconstruction. It's when Blacks earned the right to vote and the South saw its first state-funded public schools. Now, our next guest says it's time to bring Reconstruction back. Robert Hockett, the Edward Cornell Professor of Law at Cornell Law School, joins us now. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor. So I want to start... Uh, on what we've been seeing lately across the country, a lot of protests and a lot of people have been saying, okay, what do we do now? And you're saying we need to bring reconstruction back. Why? Yeah. So I think, you know, we as Americans like sort of historical antecedents. We like to look back to precedents in our own history uh, when it comes to sort of looking at least for some hints uh, as to what to do to address particular crises. And as you'll remember, a couple of weeks ago, there was a lot of talk about how this is looking a bit like 1968. That was the last time there was as much activism in the streets, particularly around racial matters or racial justice matters. Um, there's been talk about comparisons to the Great Depression era as well. And then, of course, for obvious reasons, comparisons to 1980. 1819, um, when the last time that we had a huge national pandemic. Um, and what sort of struck me is that if we look back to the period of the Reconstruction, there's a sense in which all of that is combined in one era. Because in effect, what we had then was a, a concerted national effort to redress, first of all, a profound form of wealth injustice that was a consequence of the racial or civil rights injustice that was slavery, right? There was a huge wealth gap uh, between African Americans on the one hand and others on the other hand, precisely because by definition, uh, people who have been enslaved have negative net worth, right? So they're sort of leaving the starting gate um, way behind everybody else. And so there was talk about giving all previous, uh, all, all sort of, uh, freed slaves uh, particular assets to work with right from the start. That's the old 40 acres and a mule idea. Um, General Sherman uh, and General Grant had advocated actually breaking up the old southern plantations and cut, carving them up into plots of land that were large enough to, to sustain entire families and convey those to African-American families so that African-Americans would have basic assets to sort of work with in the same way that other Americans did, that would have, it seems to me, have solved a great many problems on the wealth side or on the economic side of things. There was also, as you know, great concerted national effort to make sure that African-Americans had adequate representation in Congress. Mm -hmm. We actually had a significant period where there were African-American members of the House and the Senate before Reconstruction was, was reversed. Um, so if we look back to the Reconstruction as something that was that got off to a great start, but then was sort of, in effect, stillborn or, or sort of cut off when just after it got underway, uh, it seems to me that that might be the best historical antecedent to sort of pick up and, and work from. And it does seem that the conversation now really is picking up after being stagnant or, or stillborn for really generations. Uh, in terms of, of what could be done right now, um, are there other precedents that are out there? So we've seen action, say, from Georgetown University, uh, what's been happening there. Uh, communities, uh, Chicago has done some action as well. Also what we've seen uh, possibly outside of this country, but in regards to the Holocaust, are there takeaways from other precedents that you think we can apply here uh, well uh, to move forward? Yeah, I mean, if you look at some at some programs that we have now or that we've had in the recent past, and imagine a couple of very simple tweaks to them, it seems to me that you would have some wonderful things to work with. So take the Small Business Administration, for example, or the SBA. The SBA is there essentially to help basically provide low-cost lending money uh, to small businesses that might otherwise have difficulty attracting the capital, that, the capital that they need to kind of get a good start. Imagine if you did the following. If you added to SBA's portfolio a special focus on African-American owned businesses or minority owned businesses. And furthermore, if you were to say that we're going to provide seed funding that doesn't even have to take the form of loans, these might be outright grants, or they might be conditional loans, they might be loans that can be converted to grants provided that certain conditions be met. Like for example, the number of people employed is over 25 or over 50 or what have you. Things like that would be very sort of incremental tweaks to things that we already have, but would be sort of focused on the very particular problem that we've never really seriously come to grips with since the 1860s. Well, speaking of 2020, it's an election year. So what's your stance on what President um, President Trump, obviously his stance on race, which he hasn't 
refused to give a speech on. But then when it comes to Vice President Joe Biden, who said that when it comes to reparations, he would support a study of it. So what do you think voters can expect here from these two candidates? Yeah, so my guess would be, uh, uh, so uh, Kristen and I had an, a lovely conversation yesterday, and, and, and one analogy that came up between is that with reparations uh, was to uh, gay marriage, where it was about 20 or 10, 15 years ago. So back around 20 or 15 years ago, people thought that was just impossible. People thought, that's just not going to happen. We're never really going to have that. And then all of a sudden in 2015, almost overnight, right, it just became the law of the land. My guess is that reparations is kind of similar in the sense that a lot of people who right now have never thought about it or heard of it, their initial reaction is, oh my God, that sounds really radical. I guess we better just do a study at most. But my guess is also uh, that this will be normalized rather rather quickly, uh, especially now that um, the public attention has been sort of focused finally on the, the real nature of and the real depth of the problem. So my guess would be that we would see the so-called Overton window shifting significantly in the next few years to the point where we'll be talking quite seriously about reparations. I, we're going to hear from people like Mr. Biden are, yeah, let's do a study. And note maybe just in passing that even that much, right, is, is rather a, a remarkable, I think, move given where we were, say, two or three years ago, right? Two or three years ago, people would have said, well, what about affirmative action? Wasn't that reparations? Wasn't that enough? Um, and they would have just sort of said, just flat out just dismissed it if you had talked about actual reparations. But the fact that even Mr. Biden is willing to countenance a study about what, how we might do it and whether it might do some good, I think is actually a kind of progress. Uh, and if past is prologue, the, prog the rate of the progress here is apt to accelerate, I think, going forward. So what does Reconstruction look like? In 2020, because after the Civil War and enfranchisement for, you know, for African-Americans, it meant starting public schools. But what does it mean now in this year? I think it means a few things. Uh, for one thing, I think that it means uh, hopefully Chief Justice uh, Roberts would recognize now uh, that what he said back in 2013 in the Shelby County decision to the effect that, well, we really don't have a problem with voting rights any longer, and so we really don't have to police the way certain states actually conduct elections, was maybe a little bit premature, if I might put it politely, uh, and that we actually require affirmative reinforcement of the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts of the 1960s. The disenfranchisement in Georgia uh, and Kentucky, most recently, of course, has been an outright an absolute and utter scandal, and it's completely contrary to the intentions of those great enactments of the 1960s. Then, going to the economic side of the ledger, um, we have to go back, I think, again to the 1860s, as you suggested, Kristen, to kind of look for the right precedent. And I think the focus ought to be on asset owning and the spreading of asset owning and business owning into communities that are part of our national community that have still never been compensated for in effect what was negative asset owning that was slavery, right? If you didn't even own your own labor, um, you know, you were really starting from way behind the starting line once freedom came. And so I think what we really would be talking about then would be reparations that might take a number of different forms, but one would be outright public support for minority-owned businesses or, or actual acquisition of businesses by African Americans. Um, and that would be, I think, a terrific start, a terrific way to kind of get started on what we really should have been doing and had begun to do back in the 1860s, but again, just didn't complete because politics ended up, in effect, sort of cutting the Reconstruction short mm -hmm. before we had been more than two or three years into it. So much more work to be done. Uh, thanks for joining us for this conversation. Uh, Robert Hockett, Cornell Law School professor.